edition of Can We Talk. With us in the studio is none other than author extraordinaire Raymond Aaron, the author for The Chicken Soup for the Canadian Soul. He has accomplished many things, a very intriguing personality, an inspiring man, and I'm very pleased and happy to welcome in the studio Mr. Raymond Aaron. Raymond, how are you today? Wonderful. Glad to be here. I'm so excited to have you here. Uh, we got a lot to go through, and I hope to get through most of it, or at least some of it, within the hour allotment that we have. Uh, first off, uh, as I mentioned, you are the author of The Chicken Soup for the Canadian Soul. Can you touch upon that and just tell us how that came about? Because that's a very popular series of uh, written novels and books. Well, Jack Canfield was a colleague of mine. I hired him to speak to my clients. I teach people how to double their income doing what they love. And Jack Canfield loved that theme, so I invited him to come to Canada, to Toronto actually, and to present to my clients. And he got to like me and to know me, and he said one day when he was riding the top of the Chicken Soup for the Soul wave that he wanted to create national chicken soup books, Chicken Soup for the Nation Soul, and he wanted to do it with Canada first. So he asked me, he said, you're the most famous Canadian I know, would you please do the very first national chicken soup book? And so I did Chicken Soup for the Canadian Soul, and it was the number one best-selling book every week for six months after it came out. And we had a very big laugh later. Uh, Jack confided in me I was the only Canadian he knew. And so, <laughs> maybe that's how I got the book, I don't know. Well, that's an easy way to kind of do it. We, he, he established uh, the Chicken Soup for the Soul books, and was uh, it all set up for you automatically, or did it take some effort to establish that, to collect the stories and make it within a Canadian context for the book? It took us four years to collect 5,000 stories from across Canada and then winnow it down to the best 84 stories. Five, four years to collect 5,000 stories. We read them all. We thanked each person who submitted stories. And we didn't write the stories. The chicken soup concept, for your listeners who don't, are not familiar, it's actual stories, actual life experiences, experienced by Canadians across the country, some ordinary people and some famous celebrities. And then we collected those stories and published it in a book. It's a very, very arduous process. And the collection of input from different Canadians giving their story to make it within the paradigm of the Chicken Soup for the Soul book was a success. As you say, the number one book and uh, very much uh, a successful endeavor indeed. You mentioned at the beginning too that you teach people how to double their income doing what they love. Yes. Can you expand on yes. that? Yes. What I noticed is that there's a lot of people who are unhappy with their job and they fear that if they don't continue it, that they'll lose everything. And I say to them, would you like to do more of what you love? And they, they laugh at me. They say things like, well, if I do what I love, I have to take and cut and pay. What I've noticed is that people who don't do what they love imagine that they need a cut in pay to do what they love. But then I say to them, can you think of a very wealthy person? They say, yeah, sure, Bill Gates. And I say, do you think he loves writing software? And they say, sure. I say, how about Donald Trump? Do you think he loves buying real estate and selling real estate and being on TV shows? They say, sure. And I say, well, think of a very wealthy person who dislikes what they do and they can't think of anybody. And so what I notice is the people who are unhappy don't earn much. The people who love what they do earn a lot. And yet the people who are unhappy think they have to take a cut and pay to do what they love. It's completely wrong. Everybody who's doing what they love is earning a fortune. And everyone who's doing what they don't like is grinding it out and don't liking it. And so what I do is I teach people how to identify what they love. Now your listeners might say, oh, I know what I love. I love sleeping in. I love my spouse. I love my dog. But you're deeper than that. Like silkworms have two or three things that they love, but humans have about 20 things that they love. And I've got a patented technique that allows you to bypass your sensor to get truly at what you love as opposed to your social obligations. And when you identify what you love, and then you move closer to what you love every month and away from what you don't love, you pretty soon have around you everything that you love, regardless of whether you think your boss is not flexible and all that stuff. Because for 27 years, in fact, this month, May, is my 27th anniversary of teaching these principles around the world. I started right here in the Toronto area in May of 1983. 27 wow. years ago, I taught all over the world. I teach people how to identify what their love is and then do more and more of their love. Do you think that the reason why people do earn substantial rewards, and not necessarily in financial gain, although that is important, do you think the reason is because they love it, they're willing to give it that extra effort, that extra dedication, and that extra commitment? So that thought of, oh, I'll have to take a pay cut, is a it, it doesn't make sense because if you love it, you're committed to make it work. Is that part of the reason why that is? One part is you'll love it, you'll take the extra courses or read the extra books because you're excited. 
but if I asked you to do something out of the ordinary and something you didn't love, if I said, would you like to take a course in something you don't love, you say, oh, all right, I'll do it if I have to, but you won't really get excited. You won't eagerly find people that you would like to associate with. But there's another reason, Ron. It takes a minute to explain this. Can I do it? Please do so, yes. Uh, one of my clients went from $60,000 a year to $300,000 a year in one month. Do you want to hear that story? Yeah, I do okay. actually, I actually okay. do, yes. And here it is. He, he came to me, told me the story. It was amazing. He was a client of mine, and he was a salesman. And he was the top salesman for the company every month. He did very well as a salesman. And he came to me one day and said, the company's been bought out. They parachuted a new uh, president in. I don't know what the heck's going to happen with my job, and he was quite worried. The president interviewed each person for a long time, took notes, and then called everybody together and said, okay, here's the deal, you're only allowed to do what you love. Well, they thought this guy was a hippie that was escaped from the 60s, and they didn't know what, what on earth was going to happen. And what he said is, I've written down all the things you love, and you're only going to do that, and everything you don't love is going to be given to somebody else. Well, he loved selling. He loved talking to people and convincing them that the product that, that he had to offer was perfect for them. And if it was, I mean, he was really good about that. But he hated paperwork, and he hated cold calling to make appointments, and he hated calling them back if they didn't show up for the appointment. There's all kinds of things he didn't like, but he loved selling. There's other salesmen in the company that really were a bit shy, although they were pretty good at sales. They were a bit shy, and they really didn't like to do the selling process because they didn't like to get turned down. But they were really happy to be in the back room and do the paperwork and make the cold calling, and they loved that. And so what he did is he rearranged everybody's duties. And he said to my client, you're only allowed to sell. It was a one-hour presentation. You have to be here at 9 o'clock for first presentation, then 10 o'clock, then 11 o'clock, and then 12 o'clock, and then 2 o'clock, etc. And he said, what about 1 o'clock? I said, well, don't you want to eat? And he said, if I have a life like that, I don't even want to eat. I'll come earlier, I'll stay later. I mean, what? Wow. Because he said, I only get to do my one-hour presentation if I do all the hard work, hard for him, of doing the phone 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 calls, confirming the calls, making sure they show up, and then afterwards filling out all the paperwork. And he, he said, I hated all that. But that's all done by other people now. Well, within one month, the company's profits soared, and his income went from 60000 to $300,000 because he was doing only what he loved. He was closing. Only what he loved. Nothing else. Nothing. Just strictly nothing what all. he loves. And he thought it was impossible. Because he thought that the way you make a presentation is that you have to find the person, and then once you once you get once you made the presentation, you either have to call them back if they didn't buy to get them in again, or do the paperwork if they did buy. He only did what he loved. Other people who were doing just the paperwork, their income was going up because there were more closings, and so everybody was earning more. And his income went from sixty thousand to three hundred thousand. Here's the funny thing: that's true for you, Ron and for me and for everyone who's listening, your income should be two or three or maybe six times higher than it is, even if you can't believe me, because many of the things you do during the day are completely unproductive. All the emails that are useless and all the social networking and all the, ev everything that you do that isn't the highest and best use of your time drags your income down. All those things. Let's say you don't, for example, me. I hate raking the leaves. I hate it. But it was my job. I was the husband, so I had to rake the darn leaves. I'd come home in the fall, and I'd see the leaves, and I'd say, okay, I have a rake, I have the motor skills, but I never actually did it. And then the snow would come, and I'd say, oh, thank gosh, I don't have to rake the leaves. It's all under the snow. But then the spring would come, and the leaves turned into brown mush, which was even worse. This would go on for years. I hired the neighbor kid for $5 a season. That's all he wanted. I paid him more. But he only wanted $5, and it freed me up. Every time I came home after the neighbor boy was in charge, and I saw other people have leaves on their lawn, and mine was always spotless, it uplifted me, and I felt wonderful. And from that creativity, I was able to produce new products to help my clients even better. My income went up because I delegated the things I didn't like to do. And when you delegate the things that you don't want to do, that you're doing a lousy job at, like taxes. Everyone does their own taxes. They do it lousy. They've never taken courses in it. They sub-optimize their income. They make adding mistakes when they're doing it. And, and they have no knowledge of it. I say to somebody, what I want you to do, my taxes, they say, oh, no, I'm terrible at it. I say, well, why do you do your own? You hate it. You leave it off to the last minute. You're terrible at it. You don't get as much money back as you should. And so when you think of all the things you do that you're darn well no good at and say to yourself, 
How much would somebody pay you to do that? You say, I don't know, five bucks an hour. I'm terrible at it. Well, all the things you do that are worth five and ten dollars an hour, and you want to earn thirty and fifty dollars an hour, and you're spending tens of hours every week or every month doing what's worth maybe five bucks an hour, that's what's hauling your income down. Very fascinating topic. Doing only what you love will help you win in all facets of your life. I'm Ron Batty, and we're broadcasting live to air with Raymond Aaron in the studio live. We'll be opening up the phone lines. If you want to call in and ask Raymond a question, the number here at the station is 905-951-2899. Or you can email your question at info at We'll be right back after these commercial messages.